a program that uh, is hosted by the Center for Research in Open Source Software at the Baskin Engineering uh, School of, at UC Santa Cruz. Um, we're very excited about this. This is a new experiment to uh, get industry more directly involved in summer internships at UC Santa Cruz. So the background of this is the Center for Research in Open Source Software. Uh, I want to say a few words about what we're doing here. Um, the mission of CROSS is to bridge the gap between student research and open source projects. And it's been funded by Sage Weil um, and uh, by corporate membership. Um, for all who don't know, Sage Weil is a alumni of UC Santa Cruz. He graduated in uh, 2007 and he is the creator of SETH, which is a very popular storage system today. Um, the uh, CROSS uh, mission is to teach students on how to engage productively in open source communities. Uh, we fund high impact research uh, with a plausible path to successful open source software projects. And we incubate developer communities around research uh, prototypes. Our current uh, uh, sponsors are Kyosia, Fujitsu, Seagate, and Samsung. So I want to really quickly go through this. These are very dense slides, but we don't have much time. Um, Basically, what we fund are research projects. These are graduate students, PhD students, in fact. Um, and um, they're doing cutting edge research. Um, but we also fund postdocs, uh, people who graduated uh, from uh, uh, with a PhD and are very passionate about uh, the uh, prototype that they created as part of their PhD project and now want to create an open source developer community around that research prototype. Um, so we are now adding undergraduate students to this picture to fulfill the mission of CROSS to educate students, um, but we're also to jumpstart developer communities and open source projects. Um, and we found that uh, uh, undergraduate students who are involved in these open source projects um, have career changing experiences. They t tell me every year that this experience has really changed their outlook in the job market and that this provides the mentorship of uh, the cross fellows provide a highly relevant open source experience for them. So how do we include industry more directly into this? Um, uh, we create a marketplace for student summer projects. This is what this is. So basically, we're trying to get a marketplace that matches industry partners, student and mentors um, for a, summer, a period of a summer. Um, and it's centered around uh, project ideas. And the way this works, um, it's based on our experience with the Google Summer of Code. We took some of that structure and turned it into a protocol. Um, so you can see there are four uh, stakes in the ground of summer projects, right? And uh, the stakeholders are industry partners, uh, cross uh, fellows and students. And this is sort of this diagram, I think most of you are familiar with, uh, of communicating processes, um, very, very common in computer science and on distributed systems. But here we use it as a way of showing how this is uh, going to work. So cross begins with a call for project ideas. This goes to the fellows of CROSS, research and incubator fellows, and they come back with their project ideas and all of this gets uh, uh, curated in a, uh, uh, in a, in a web page. Uh, these project ideas then are then communicated uh, throughout the university to all students, as well as to our uh, industry partners. And that's where we actually are, right? This is a kickoff meeting that shows off those project ideas. And now the next step is for industry partners to upvote fellows. And the way this works is when you upvote a fellow that we ask you to uh, uh, pledge $9,500 uh, per upvote. And uh, these are then used to fund summer students. Independently of this, uh, these project ideas that are now being, you know, have been advertised to students, students can apply to these project ideas. And then the fellows pick out the best matches uh, of those uh, project ideas and then uh, tell 
across what the best matches are. And depending on what kind of upwards we get, uh, we then uh, provide summer student slots. These are funding slots. These are funded position for summer interim um, that are given to the fellow. And the fellow can then use those to pick the best students he or she wants to work with and select those students. And then also invites the industry partners who upvoted the uh, 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 fellow uh, to, to participate in this, right? So I want to call out a few things here. First, this web page, uh, we advertise it already in the invitation, is ucross.github.io slash projects. Uh, this is where uh, those project ideas are listed. And we just added a whole bunch of new ones. This is a living document. And so we, you know, please check often in the next few days because uh, projects are being, or project ideas are still being added. Um, the next thing is when you decide to upload a student, uh, a fellow, um, please send email to crossinfo at ucsc.edu. Um, and then we can uh, uh, respond on how you can actually uh, pay for the upload. Uh, the next thing is, how do we actually uh, give out summer student slots? So we were prioritized by the best matches of upvoted fellows. And so uh, in more detail, the prioritization looks like this. Best matches uh, of upvoted fellows are highest priority, right? So if you upvote a fellow, that fellow is more likely to get um, uh, funded for, uh, for the, the best matches he or she is selected from the student applications. Um, the next uh, lower prioritization is uh, fall funding for these best matches. So what actually happens sometimes is that, um, that undergraduate students are able to continue to work on this project. And so if we have uh, money left uh, from uh, from the summer project um, funding, then we actually use that for fall funding of those same project, right? So we still, the industry still gets the prioritization that uh, uh, industry partners signal to us, uh, but extended into the fall. And then the third uh, tier is the best matches of other fellows, right? If we have still money left over from that. Um, so once the summer projects start, uh, we have regular project meetings that include student, fellow, and industry partners. This is essentially the summer, we, we see these summer projects as a very interactive way to engage industry. And, um, and by upvoting fellows, industry can tell us basically which projects we should focus on. Um, here's the timetable. Um, so we start, uh, we have a very tight timeline. Uh, summer is upon us. Um, uh, by July 7th, we ask you to send us uh, the upvotes. Um, and uh, we also ask the fellows to send uh, the best matches to cross. And then on the day later, we assign summer student slots to the fellows based on the prioritization that I just outlined. On, on the 9th, uh, fellows select students, or by the 9th, uh, as, uh, and then uh, invite industry partners to provide upvotes. Uh, and, uh, and then the fellows coordinate with students and industry partners a meeting schedule over the summer. And again, you know, we envision that, uh, for instance, industry partner, we do have that actually in CROSS in general that you can have weekly meetings, bi-weekly meetings, it's up to the fellows and industry partners to sort of come up with a schedule that works for all parties. Uh, on August the 1st, we ask our industry partners who sent in upvotes to, um, to gift the $9,500 by, by August 1st um, per upvote. Um, uh, we understand that, of course, you won't be able to immediately pay these $9,500, uh, so, but we essentially give you um, a month. And then uh, on, on September 25th, 
that's when the, the summer ends, uh, the academic summer ends. Uh, we have uh, reports, both from the students and the mentors. Um, we are not sure yet whether we need monthly reports. Um, uh, there's probably, depending on the workload, uh, uh, this is something that we have to still iron out. On the October 5th, we have uh, the cross-industry advisory be board meeting, um, and non-members uh, can attend once with one-sided NDA. Um, so, and then the following four days, we have an online version of the fifth cross-research symposium where we show up student work, right? We have done this in the past four years. That was a two-day, two-track event but because of uh, the pandemic, we're planning to do this online this year and, and turn it into a four day event. So how does this look in our diagram? Um, so today is June 30th. Uh, we uh, hope that you will send us upvotes by July 7th. Uh, we will then very quickly turn this around into actual selections because um, this year, uh, this process is a little lopsided because a lot of the applications, uh, the project ideas have been known to the students for the past month. And uh, we have already six great applications. So we can very quickly uh, turn those around, but we expect even more applications in the near future. Um, so, uh, so this is why we're actually very optimistic that we can actually turn this around very quickly. Um, but because we're doing this for the first time, right? If we, none of these deadlines are super hard, if we're like slipping a little bit, that's okay too. Um, but we want to sort of get going and 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 have the summer project really start on July 9th, so we have the most of the time of the summer to actually really dedicate to the project work, which ends on September 25th. If you are not a cross member yet. Uh, Dear industry partners, um, uh, you could become a cross member and uh, could get involved beyond summers, right? So we see this open source research experience also as a way to get more companies interested in cross and to see what we're doing. Uh, cross members, uh, in, in just to see sort of how this fits into this particular context, um, uh, can actually influence the direction of cross, it can influence how we, what projects we choose. We have two IAB meetings per year in which cross members make recommendations and uh, uh, perform reviews of our projects and our fellows. And this has been uh, in our last five years, uh, a tremendously productive relationship. Um, we have also, as, as, as a cross member, you get, uh, to uh, access to our fantastic advisory committee, uh, who include, uh, which include Doug Cutting, Garen Sandler, Nisa Strutman, Sage Weil, and James Davis. Um, and uh, again, I want to point out, you know, our current members are Kyosha, Fujitsu, Seagate, and Samsung. The next industry advisory board meeting is on Monday, October 5th. Um, and again, non-members can attend under NDA. So I want to just quickly thank uh, a lot of people who've been, uh, have had a part in creating CROSS and, and coming up with the idea and then also in coming up with the research experience. And we want to thank our current and past sponsors. And again, our contact is uh, uh, Carlos Malza and Carlos M at ucsc.edu and Stefan Eliegi at, um, uh, sleg at ucsc.edu, and then also our website is cross.ucsc.edu. So um, I want to pause here for a little bit and ask whether there's any questions um, uh, at this point. Um, I hope that I don't have to actually um, do anything to open up questions. Um, You would need to, yeah, I, Stephanie here. Um, so if Q&A can, uh, people can ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, yeah. Right now there's no questions. Um, okay, well, uh, remember that you have the Q&A and then we can, you know, we can also, we are a little ahead of time, which is great. And, um, and then maybe people can 
um, uh, Let's see. There's there's also there's also the chat. Sorry, just a there's also the chat, and um, I okay. can make sure that that's set for people to. Yeah, and you can raise your hand, and we can uh, we can monitor that as well, and then uh, uh, let you speak. Okay, um, so let's move on. Uh, the The next step is to actually go and let the fellows speak. So we have four overall uh, projects um, that are led by uh, fellows. Some of them are research fellows and some of them are incubator fellows. Um, the first one is uh, Life HD, uh, uh, led by Sheng Hong Wang and his advisor, Jose Renau. The second one is uh, uh, CAFSAT by Akil Dixit and his advisor, Fokion Colitis. Um, the third one is a, so these were two research fellows, and the third one is uh, incubator fellow Jeff Lefevre, um, and who is also helped out by Co uh, Quincy Coziol from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, that's the uh, Skyhooked uh, data management project. And then the fourth one is Pupper uh, with Ivo Jimenez, who is also an incubator fellow. So um, we have about 45 minutes. Um, I like to see whether we can have at most 10 minutes for each of those points. If you have, uh, if you need less time, um, that's, that would be great because then we can also add a, a, another incubator fellow, uh, Kate Compton, who is um, uh, doing really fantastic work, but she hasn't had a chance to add any uh, project ideas yet, um, but she could give an overview and then add these project ideas later. Um, so without further delay, um, I will give the floor to Jose or Sheng Hong, who wants to talk first. I'll do the presentation, Jose. The only thing I need yeah. the permission to share the screen. Someone is sharing. Okay, hold on. Um, I have it. Uh, it was just that yeah. you were sharing. I couldn't share at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm assuming you see the slides. Yep. Yep. Okay. We do. So thank you for hosting this event. Um, what I'm going to be talking is the work we are doing, uh, and our group is that is led by Sean Han. So it's a productive open source hardware development flow. So a little bit of background so that we see what we are working here at, and then to explain the project. Uh, so my name is Jose Renau, I'm a professor at UC Santa Cruz. I'm traditionally what most people would call a computer architect. Uh, but what we are focusing here is the work to make a more hardware productive tools, how to make chips faster and more productive. Uh, this is the work by a large team. Uh, there are several PhD students working on this. Uh, the, PhD student leading this effort is Shen Hong Wang, uh, that he's connected online uh, to. And, but there are some other PhD students, some master students, and there are some undergrad students already working. And there are many contributions by each one of them. So a little bit of background to understand what are we doing, what's the problem, what we're targeting. So the problem that we are trying to address is to make hardware design productivity improvements. So we think that the current hardware design tools are very unproductive and we target simulation and synthesis, but when we, mostly on the synthesis, we are focusing at the moment for FPGA. It can be extended in the future for ASICs, but the current focus is FPGAs. And we have uh, three main things to show novelty against industry or other open source tools is one thing is that we have an open source flow for interfacing with third party tools. The other one, we put a significant effort to be incremental, to have very fast iterations. And that's one of the big hammers to improve productivity in comparison with industry. And then we want to have a scalable flow. The industry is scalable, but the open source tools that tend to be here and there don't tend to be so scalable. So what is the project? It's what we call Life HD. It's for life hardware development. The idea is like a compiler. So many of the little projects is gonna be building passes on this compiler. So what is the typical thing that we do? We read Verilog, 
which is the hardware description language usually used by most of the industry. It's either Verilog or VHDL, but nearly everybody now uses Verilog. And then you read Verilog, we transform internally into our L graph, which is a graph representation, and then we do compiler transformations inside. And at the end of the compiler transformations, we generate usually very low as the output. That's what we started to do. But we have many other inputs and outputs, like there is some student working on a JSON interface. We have interfaces for visualization, for grass base. There are several inputs and outputs. And what we have been working in the last year is been to interface with other languages. And this is something that several students can get involved so that we have other languages in addition to Verilog and we are interfacing to the, to the compiler infrastructure. Because we're interfacing with the compiler infrastructure, there is a lot of common pieces that it can be shared across many languages and what we call the LNATS, Language Neutral AST. This is a very, even though we are working on hardware, this is a very compiler infrastructure kind of background. So we built an AST, then we have a graph, we do SSA transformations, which are typical compilers, but we have things like graph partitioning. We have many of those things that combine typical hardware with compilers infrastructure. Now the, the LNAS is more like a, a traditional compiler they call a control flow graph, uh, which is just a tree-like structure. And we have some documentation to build. And now we have the we also have the graph representation that is more like a net list representation. So internally, the database have two major data structures, which is a graph-like representation and a tree-like representation. And there are many little projects that we have. So some example little projects that we have. The, the website across, we have to update with the latest updates, but in the, GitHub for the code, we have some updates on the project. I'll update the cross soon. But for example, there are three undergrad students already working this summer uh, in Live HD. They have been interacting for a few weeks already. And it's to give an idea of the project. One of the students is working to implement a floor planner for Live HD. So there are many papers on the literature how to do floor planning. Floor planning is to get the design of how to place them in a layout in an FPGA or in an ASIC. So how to, where, what cells go where. So the student is getting a, state, a paper that is, we consider is one of the state of the arts and is implementing that paper, interfacing with our infrastructure. It's a way to test our infrastructure. It's a way to have a better floor planet. So, and the student learns how, what's the state of the art. Uh, another project, that's also another student working on this, an undergrad student this summer, is what we call the LNAS checker. Uh, so we have different languages that create this language neutral AST. Sometimes they do mistakes or sometimes you code incorrectly. So this is a pass that it checks that the tree structure is correct because there are many, for example, you do an assignment, you have to have an assignment variable on the right hand side of the statement. So there are gonna be many checks like that. So the student is doing a checker on this. Uh, the other student is trying to, is help starting to help on the chisel fertile interface. So he's, he's a student who has worked with a little on Verilog, a little bit with chisel, and he's creating testing examples and trying to do more regular testing infrastructure for the fertile passes. So these are three projects that gives an idea of what we're doing. As you can see, there are very, there are many little projects that are perfect for summer. Projects that are open that we have, that some, someone can do. We have interface with our open source synthesis tool that is called MacTurtle. This is working for simple blocks, but it has some blocks that is failing. So the idea is will be to finish it up, getting more testing blocks, and maybe even to synthesize in parallel because we know how to do the parallelization of this block. Uh, a little bit uh, more on the front end side, we are doing a language that is interfaced with Live HD, it's called Pyro. Uh, in the uh, Atom editors from GitHub, 
they have a new grammar that they do three seater it's an incremental grammar which fits very well with the work that we do so if someone wanted to implement that incremental grammar for pyro it will be an interesting project similarly and maybe a little bit connected to that project we want to have a support on the editor like for BI or Atom, so it's to build a language server. So again, this is more like JavaScript kind of work. And we have more traditional graph partitioning, coloring projects that they are very useful for the synthesis and for different steps. So those are four examples of projects that I will provide more details, but if you're interested, feel free to contact me. Now, a little bit less coding in some of them is to do a competitive analysis with Vivado, Altera, ABC, Mortartle, and to see where are the pros and cons, where do they work well or not. It's to try several codes from open source and to see where is the good, where is the bad, so that we can learn and improve. Uh, we have some simple check passes on the LGraph, like for example, talking to the teacher for 100 class uh, that is logic design, they will find useful to find a way to find combinational loops because the students tend to code that and generate that type of mistake. So with the, our tool, it will be very easy to find it, but we have to create the pass to look for combinational loops. Or we can do a pass to the cross crop checks. Uh, so there are many simple passes that sometimes can be useful for classes or can be uh, used for other projects that it will be important, to, uh, interesting to implement. Uh, one of the projects is already documented is to import from Liberty which is a standard for synthesis libraries. And then what we also have is we are very focused on performance. Uh, so currently we have a re testing regression infrastructure, but we don't have so much a performance regression infrastructure. Uh, so the idea is to bring it up maybe with something like Prometheus to create a graphical interface so that every time we do commits, we can keep track of the performance progression of the infrastructure so that we don't have a slowdowns, we keep improving the performance and the system keeps being scalable. So those are the type of projects. Notice that there is a lot of potential for smaller projects if you are interested. Um, see that. And if you want to send me an email, uh, that should be the idea for the project. But there are different skills, very lock, JavaScript, C++, and different backgrounds. So there are no questions, we can move to the next speaker. Um, the, the quick question from uh, Maya, um, she asked what um, FPGA tools do you target downstream? So we have some of the silings. Um, it, we have similar to the Amazon F1 boards. So we have it in the lab. We we got them recently and because of the COVID we didn't install on the servers. But the thing that we are targeting mostly is uh, Lattice FPGAs uh, because there are open source infrastructure on, around them. So you have a full spec of everything. And then we target silings. Uh, technically it can work with many, but those are the main ones that we are targeting now. Have, we, yeah, we don't have any more questions. Cool. So the next one is, thank you, Jose. Um, so, you know, you can always add more questions and you can also directly contact Jose. Yeah, I see a um, question and answer. Okay, online. perfect. Um, so the next one is CAFSAT and I believe it's Akil uh, who's gonna present. Yes. Akil? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Yep, we can see it. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about a project CAFSAT that stands for Consistent Answers via Satisfiability. Uh, my name is Akhil Dikshit and my PhD advisor and the principal investigator of CAFSAT is Professor Pokion Colitis. Uh, so let me start with some a brief introduction or a background to this project. So we are talking about 
uh, inconsistent databases here. So in the relational databases, uh, we often accompany the schemas with uh, int integrity constraints. And some simple examples could be primary key constraints or functional dependencies and so on. And uh, the databases that violate uh, these constraints are known as inconsistent databases. In the real world, uh, due to several reasons and in various different contexts, inconsistent databases are extremely common. In fact, they are unavoidable. Uh, the reasons behind inconsistent databases could be uh, data integration from heterogeneous sources or data warehousing and so on. So how, how do we handle uh, inconsistent databases? Uh, there are primarily two approaches. The first one is data cleaning. And the idea here is uh, you somehow remove the inconsistencies. Uh, you may rely on heuristics. You may rely on external data sources or particular domain knowledge, dom domain experts in, in some cases. And you, you get rid of the inconsistencies. And then you use the cleaned version of the data to evaluate your queries and get the answers. Uh, this is the most uh, widely used approach in the industry today. Uh, but the problem with this approach is uh, data cleaning is often ad hoc. And the reason behind that is it often requires making arbitrary choices while cleaning the data. For example, if your database has uh, uh, entries with, uh, I mean, if, if, if you have two books and they have the same ISBN number, for example, where your integrity constraint says that a book should have a unique ISBN number, uh, then you, you want to remove one of the two uh, entries, but there may not be an a priori reason uh, which one to keep and which one to remove, right? So in, in these cases, data cleaning may require arbitrary choices. The second approach uh, is called consistent query answering. And it is fundamentally different from data cleaning in the sense that uh, the inconsistencies in the data are kept as they are, but uh, we consider all possible repairs of the database while executing the query. So I'll not go into the detail of uh, what are repairs, but th these are like uh, all possible ways in which you could clean the data and you, you consider all of them while executing a query. This is arguably more scientific and principled compared to data cleaning. Uh, because it provides very strong semantic guarantees uh, that you cannot uh, get from data cleaning. Uh, now let me let me talk about CAVSAT. So CAVSAT is a system that follows consistent query answering approach. Right. So CAVSAT uh, again it stands for consistent answers via satisfiability. It's a system to answer queries over these inconsistent databases. In general, uh, computing these consistent answers is a computationally hard problem, and therefore it is unlikely to have efficient algorithms. Uh, this uh, produces challenges when we have extremely large databases. Uh, the complexity is high, that's why uh, your algorithms are quite slow. So the idea, the main idea behind CAFSAT is that uh, it reduces the problem of consistent query answering to a very well-known and widely studied uh, hard problem uh, called Boolean satisfiability, better known as SAT or SAT. Uh, and it uses state-of-the-art SAT solvers uh, to, to solve the SAT instances. And from these solutions, it, it computes back uh, the consistent answers. Now, uh, let me briefly uh, talk about SAT solvers. So for the past, two decades or so, uh, there has been tremendous progress in SAT solving technology. And we have witnessed several modern SAT solvers that are capable of solving instances with extremely high uh, size. And because of that, SAT solvers are emerging as uh, general purpose problem solving tools. So this is a very nice idea that if you have a computationally hard problem, you reduce it to SAT and then use uh, SAT solvers. So we are the first one to do this for uh, answering queries on inconsistent databases. Uh, on the right side, uh, we have a modular architecture of CAVSAT. 
again i'll not go into the detail but the idea is uh, in the query preprocessor module we take the input query and uh, and find out its complexity of computing the consistent answers and based on the complexity we forward this query to several modules uh, designed to handle queries of particular complexity the last module is is the sat solving module so if the if cqa is computationally hard uh, or if the complexity is unknown we could send it to the sat solving module the modules that are shown in green are the ones that are already developed only one module uh, is is yet to be developed uh, and for the open source summer experience uh, we have several project ideas uh, we have received two applications so far but we are looking to hire uh, i mean we are looking to take one student on board the first idea is the implementation of some efficient algorithms for cqa so as i said uh, in general cqa is a computationally hard problem but for certain classes of queries and integrity constraints which are which are very useful in practice uh, cqa can actually be solved efficiently and uh, researchers have uh, given some efficient algorithms to do that uh, so what we are planning to do is uh, with with an undergraduate student uh, he the, the student could learn and understand these algorithms and implement them and then the next task would be to to run extensive experiments on synthetic as well as uh, real world data sets to measure performance of these algorithms against say something like sat solvers because you you can always use sat solvers to solve cqa even if it is efficiently solvable so the the main idea is is it worth uh, going for these efficient algorithms or it, it it's better to simply send this problem to sat solvers directly we would like to investigate investigate uh, this this gap if it exists between uh, theory and practice uh, the second main uh, tasks uh, for an undergraduate student would be uh, to compare consistent query answering against uh, data cleaning so this this uh, point has come up very frequently in in the past few months of our research uh so cqa and data cleaning as i told are fundamentally different approaches and uh, to compare these two approaches it it's very challenging because uh it involves first it involves bringing these two approaches on the same platform to even carry out a meaningful comparison so this this involves uh even developing further the semantics of uh of of query answers and so on and in this particular task uh, the student would uh, gather large real world data sets and again run experiments with cavsat and also some state of the art data cleaning system such as such as holoclean uh, which which is a very popular uh, data cleaning system uh, apart from that uh, a secondary task if if the student is interested uh, we are developing a front end for cavsat which is based on javascript and react js uh, framework so if the student would like to contribute in the front end development uh, they are welcome to do so so these these are the ideas that we are planning to work in the summer uh, with this i would like to thank you all for listening and i'm happy to take any questions any questions I see there are already online Q and A going on. Um, uh, yeah, please go ahead and do the uh, use that Q and A feature. Um, if there are no other questions, I can't. I think yeah, I don't see any raised hands. Um, I will then let's continue with um, Skyhook. Um, so Jeff, do you want to start? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Okay, great, excellent. Sure, so can I share my screen here? Um,
Is that visible Perfect. to everybody? Yep, okay, great. we can see it. Okay, cool. Um, okay, uh, thank you for coming. I'm Jeff Lefevre. Uh, I'm an assistant adjunct professor here at UCCM Cruz, and um, I lead the Skyhook Data Management Project. And the project uh, topic there is storage and management of tabular data in Ceph. Um, so let me describe to you a bit of what this means. Okay. So the goal of this project is to enable data management functions within Ceph scalable distributed object storage. And that means we'd like to utilize a storage to do some work for a database, for instance, or a client application. Um, the way we go about doing this is we're going to create plugins for Ceph. Um, and to do that, we utilize an existing interface that's inside Ceph called the uh, Objects Extensions Interface or CLS mechanism. And what that means is we can develop customized uh, code, right, that objects can execute right on the object storage servers. And the code would do a couple of things. In our case, we're going to offload some processing. So we want to do something like select and project, aggregate, think of typical database um, push down functionality or offloading. And so these go directly onto storage and are executed by objects. And we also um, exploring a, a different angle, which is a physical design. Right? So that includes things like indexing data at the object level, at the storage local level. Um, it also includes things like reformatting data. For instance, from format X to Y, um, we consider like Google flat buffers or arrow or other formats could be considered JSON as well. I also might want to repartition data. And so this is a, typically a heavyweight operation in databases, and we'd like to be able to do this directly in storage. So these are some of the functionalities that we're working on and have implemented. And why would we do this? Well, if we can leverage a storage, to do some of these tasks, right, we can scale out data processing, right? So you can think of a single node database instance, right, which would sit on top of maybe a local disk or RAID array or even in the cloud, right? Um, if you can scale out most of these operations um, and they're object local and storage server local, then as you scale out the SEP cluster, right, we can get this parallelization of object task uh, processing that we offload. Um, and the way you might access this kind of thing is through an external table interface. Most database have these. Right? Uh, it's a foreign data wrapper in Postgres. Um, we also have a Python SQL client that we've been developing. And um, the benefits are, in addition to the scalability, right, we're, we're reducing the resources required by a database, right? So we can reduce the data set back over the network in the distributed case, right? If we think about pushing out filters or projections and selections or aggregations, especially, right, Summer, summary techniques. Um, and then we can also reduce CPU usage, right, by pushing that filter into storage or maybe a, a regex query search, right? So like you can maybe do a regex on each little object, right? You can offload that work and, and reduce the needs of your database. Um, and just an example, like currently we can scale out tests from, you know, one to up to hundreds of thousands of objects and a billion row tables that we've run queries on. Um, and basically uh, we take table data Right. We partition it in a standard way in a database, maybe row or by column. We format it into uh, perhaps uh, Google Flat Buffers format, as I mentioned, which is kind of a row-based format, or Apache Arrow, which is a column-oriented access format. And these formats return data semantics along with some extra metadata. We're able to put some queryable metadata inside a local RocksDB. So each Ceph server has a little RocksDB instance. Um, that we can access. And inside there, we can put things like this indexing, as I mentioned, physical design. We can keep object local statistics and other things. So that's kind of the overview. And the architecture looks something like that. If you consider a subcluster, there's some objects distributed across the storage servers. There's the little RocksDB that I mentioned that might, object, uh, might index, for instance, on the right, the purple object there has an index over certain columns. Might want to do things like that. Our plugins live here right, in the OSD and the client application sits on top. And these tasks that I mentioned, they're offloaded through these plugins and through that interface. <clears throat> so that's kind of the summary of, uh, the brief summary of Skyhook and how, how it works and what are some of the benefits and goals. Um, some previous mentoring that we've done through, uh, that I've done through Cross undergrad students, um, William Lai, we've had a student implement flat buffer format. Beginning, Ruchi implemented a writer for this format. 
Then we have uh, two Google Summer of Code students from last year, Ashe, who implemented the arrow format. So this is in formatting the, the data partitions, putting them as arrow, and then writing them into Ceph objects. Um, we have a new Google Summer of Code student this year, Aditi, who's working on group by and sorting. Uh, another student, Matthew, is working on a uh, Python SQL interface, right? So you can actually type like, you know, SQL text statements into the uh, uh, Python. Uh, client. And then we have another fellow, Sean Fang, who's working on, uh, what was that? Okay, who's working on um, column star processing. So when we consider vertical partitioning rather than horizontal partitioning, right, before I showed you kind of horizontal partitioning of tables, um, if we consider um, vertical partitioning, right, then we think about things like column store processing and um, position lists or row IDs and tuple reconstruction and these kinds of things. Um, so briefly, just to show you what's going on, and so I hope I can, uh, I don't know if you, if you guys can see that link, hopefully. Um, this is our current repo. Um, we have a bunch of ongoing projects here from uh, Hello World and Small Code, We're moving into an SDK, um, integration with ServiceX, which is a physics project that we work on through Iris HEP organization. Um, this is a data delivery service for high energy physics data. Um, Rados reads and CLS, where we're trying to read data from remote objects. Um, we are implementing scalability testing through Kubernetes clusters and on bare metal. Um, we have a project that I mentioned, the Google Summer Code this year with grouping and sorting. And then the column oriented processing there as well. And you can you know, ch check out any of these and you can see the individual GitHub issues that are related. And then if I can go to just briefly mention some of our proposed projects here in this work. And we have a project, I can blow this up a little bit, it's on the web page. Um, with our Python writer, we'd like to use arrow tables. Oh, sorry, um, pi arrow tables and horizontally partition um, CSV data and JSON data and write these into Skyhook. Um, so this involves kind of accessing pi arrow, ingesting data, converting it uh, raw format into pi arrow, um, hashing based on some keys, and then um, repartitioning um, via objects, I'm sorry, via like hash partitioning or column partitioning, right? So this is row, so we plug and use hash, and then writing these to Ceph. Um, there's a project here for compaction of formatted database partitions. So you can imagine if you write objects today, and tomorrow there's some more rows added or insertions, right? Uh, if we convert these, as I mentioned, to full arrow tables, for instance, right? Now we append them to the object, so now that object might have two arrow tables in it. So we'll end up with a sequence of arrow tables. You can think of this as standard sort of cleanup or compaction or vacuum or things like that in the database uh, over time, just um, almost like garbage collection. We're going to condense those into a single arrow table in the object. Um, we have a documentation project here. Uh, for a simpler project maybe for a new student to move some of our wiki documentation into a different format. Um, so please take a look at that and there's an associated GitHub issue. Um, and then we have uh, the statistics that I mentioned. So if you think of object local statistics and keeping them in RocksDB, um, we can think of how we might use those for query processing. You know, if we offload a table scan or index plan, objects can look up their current statistics and that's local. So we can address things, consider things like data skew possibly and other things like that. Um, and lastly, we can consider things like uh, operations on array data, right? So array data is very popular in uh, this high energy physics format that I mentioned. So we consider array data as arrow list form, um, list data type, and these could be uniform length or non-uniform length lists. Um, so this is something that we're looking to add support for, for the physics data that we work with, but also arrow in general supports lists. So that's something I think that will expand Skyrim's capability for push downs and processing and storage. Um, um, and that's about all that I have real quick. And there's a few references there. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. Quincy, do you want to quickly jump in? Yes, going to. Okay. So. There was a quick question from Maya. And I think it was. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm answering it right now. So it's about QoS. Okay. Jeff, can you unshare so I can share? Yep. 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 Thank you. Thanks. So, I get this to the right window, which looks good. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm Quincy Koziel. I'm um, one of the staff members at the 
NERSC Supercomputing Center at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And I've been um, working on HDF5 and some other related technologies now for, gosh, 25 years, something like that. Um, HDF5 is a, uh, well, you know, a little bit of marketing speech here, right? A unique technology that makes it possible to manage extremely large and complex things. Um, it comes at a high level with a data model. I'll show a picture or two quickly. Um, file format that you don't ever want to see because it's complex, but it has no limits on the sizes of things, and it allows you to be very, very scalable and portable. And a um, large software library that runs, you know, Feature phones actually from Nokia all the way up to supercomputers and has language wrappers and anything you can think of. We've retired ones for Pascal and Ada and things like that. So now we're on to Python and fun things. Um, lots and lots of attention for uh, performance, uh, especially on high performance systems, uh, supercomputers around the world and lots of tools and applications to manage and analyze the data that you create. So what that looks like, oh, one last um, blurb here. Um, well, this uh, HDF technologies are used by a lot of the NASA and NOAA satellite data that is up monitoring climate. Um, so they'd like their data back in a very, very long time period, 50 years is about right. Uh, so we intend to keep our software alive and running and the data accessible uh, over that period of time. And it's extremely heavily used on HPC systems too. A couple of usage charts here at the bottom, you know, HDF5 is in the top five or so things on big supercomputers all around the world. Data model wise, very quick, there's a lot of code here, right? Um, it's a lot like a file system in a file, if that helps. Um, it's a container for storing objects, and those objects are typically up here, oops, thanks, um, stored in a hierarchical fashion with groups. Um, so you can think of the groups as analogous to directories. Um, and underneath those are a lot of data sets that are fundamentally um, arrays of data with, thank you, um, some of the data that describes them, their, their rank and dimensionality and the type of elements that are in those uh, data sets. So we've been around for about 20 years working on HDF5, but there's a tremendous amount still left to do. Um, and the technologies around us continue to evolve and uh, we'd like to keep up with those things. So some of the projects that we're proposing for this summer, um, we'll keep posting new ones up here if we get good ideas. Um, it would be really great to have an Apache Arrow for um, integration for HDF5 to uh, access the in-memory column stores that Apache Arrows creates now. And lots of that is for stream data, um, transient column-oriented stores. In our case, it might be high-speed science instruments, but it could be the tick data from um, stock markets as well. And uh, bridging that gap here will allow the lot of the analytics tools that HDF5 has to apply the Apache Arrow data that the world is creating right now. Um, along the theme here with uh, Ceph and Rados, HDF5's backends can connect on top of various object stores, and we'd like to um, harden up and really deliver a solid uh, vault connector for you know accessing objects in Rados. Um, it would be great if we could do some column-oriented storage directly in HDF5, so not exactly like Apache Arrow, but native inside the files that we produce. Um, we feel like that would be a, a really strong benefit to HDF5 applications that um, primarily access field-oriented data kind of vertically in columns. Um, Sparse data storage has been a requested feature for us for a very long time. Um, lots of people use sparse matrices in various ways, but HDF5 is not super friendly for that as we sort of assume that the arrays are dense. Um, and adding some capabilities to store sparse data would be great. It would really help those applications out. 
And finally, um, although HDF5 looks a lot like a database in some ways, um, it is not. And so it doesn't have these search and query indexing capabilities that most databases come natively with. Um, but we'd like to explore how to connect those two things together, really emphasize the strengths of query and indexing that's available in databases and match that up with the large volumes of science data that's available uh, in HDF5 and see how that could benefit both communities. Um, finally, uh, we have another research project with Surin Baina and I are meeting at Lawrence Berkeley Lab for a more next generation, um, object-oriented science storage containers, a lot of buzzwords there. Uh, but we'd like to be able to um, move that science-oriented um, object store on top of Rados as a nice scalable backend. That would be an awesome addition for us and a nice experience to move out into the cloud, possibly. So um, several good possibilities here to really uh, influence the scientific community and add you know, value to the millions of HDF5 users that are already out there. Cool, thank you, Quincy. Um, let's uh, to redirect the question and answering uh, online, if you don't mind. Um, we're running a little short of time and I'd like to give uh, uh, Ivo Jimenez uh, uh, enough time to present Papa. Ivo. Thank you. Um, so, um, my name is Ivo Jimenez. I'm a research scientist and cross incubator fellow at UC Santa Cruz. And um, today I'm presenting this project on, on Popper. And the main goal of this project is to have to use containers and container native workflows to create reproducible studies, performing tests, and all of the things that we do in R&D-ish scenarios. The, if you're not familiar with containers, this is like a very one minute introduction to it. The idea behind containers is that you, instead of having a hypervisor, you run on, the, on a virtualized environment that it's in this case, the Linux kernel. And in this scenario, um, you can containerize applications, complete software stacks uh, in a lightweight manner. And the main, well, one of the main benefits of doing that is that you can bring your own environment to share infrastructure. So you can do very quickly things that before containers would take a lot of time, like, like running, for example, a LAMP stack, like a complete web service stack from the web server all the way to the database or other more, like, more current things like running TensorFlow on a GPU and have all the details of compiling the right versions, running the exact uh, version that you would be running somewhere else at the tip of your fingers with one, just one, com one, one command. So uh, this is the main idea behind containers, bringing environments, preparing environments and sharing it with the purpose of reproducing those environments and making it easier for others to get work done. And uh, in this container native paradigm, what we do is we, everything that we do is done in a container. So anything from building software, processing data, allocating resources and whatnot uh, is done in by manipulating containers in a machine. And this has a lot of uh, productivity boosts. We have experienced it uh, firsthand in our lab. And what we're trying to do is trying to create create or, or make it easier for people, as I explained in an R&D-ish scenario, to, to adopt these, these practices. One of the things that we find when dealing with, with this container native paradigm is that there are some things that are not quite uh, amenable, like working with multiple container images. There are different container engines out there. Um, and all, there's all these adds complexity to this approach, if you are a newcomer and, and you, you grasp the basics of containers, but then you start facing all these 
very complex scenarios that you, you don't really want to be dealing with. So the idea behind Popper is to address this in a holistic um, and, and lightweight uh, manner. Um, so Popper deals uh, with the first uh, problem by allowing you to express in very simple YAML syntax uh, the steps that you take that are assuming that you run on containers. So each of these steps is creating a new container image and then you provide a script that it's inside your repository and you can very quickly um, share these YAML files and the fact that they are assuming that you run on a container uh, engine. They, the only thing you need to install is Docker or Podman or any other container engine that we support and you, someone hands you this uh, YAML or you git clone a repository that has the YAML file inside it and you can very quickly uh, run a workflow that someone else has uh, created. And it also allows you to interact with it, debug it, build on top of it, change parameters and whatnot. Uh, things that you would usually do when you're trying to, for example, read a paper and, uh, re and rerun what someone else has done. Uh, that's in a nutshell how we address this uh, side. The other, the other side is the, the different container engines that are available right now. When we have a, a container, it's easy. We install Docker. Um, and, but when we want to move to another shared infrastructure, for example, in HPC or more secure environments, you, want, you, you find yourself with the fact that you cannot run Docker, you have to use another container engine on this particular case, Singularity, and then there are others that are being developed. And then you start to see kind of like get overwhelmed in all these different container engines, each of them with their different particularities. And you, the only thing we want to do is run my workflow that I runs fine on my machine. I would like to run it somewhere else um, in an easy way, uh, which, in, Practice means taking a series of container images, running them, run the, those run fine in my machine. I would like to replicate that behavior in another machine. And with Docker, what it does is it puts an abstraction layer between the container engines and the user so that you don't have to deal with all these particularities or, or Popper is dealing with all these particular details of running in different container engines. Um, um, you, the, from the point of view of users, they just specify what the environments looks like, the packages you install, how, which commands you execute, which arguments are passed to particular steps, and which, uh, and, and which configuration files you use and whatnot, and you make that part of your repository, and then you let Popper deal with the, with the, the all the different engines and the, and the particular areas of running different engines. Um, by default, we run on, on Docker, but then you, the only thing you, you need to use in, in order to run another engine is just say, okay, I want to run on Podman now. And everything is exactly the same. Um, the other very uh, practical problem that when we work with, container, with this container native paradigm is that there's lack of common orchestration support in, 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 in shared infrastructures resource managers such as Kubernetes, Lerm in HPC scenarios, CI services that allow you to test this, uh, to run these pipelines, um, they all have very different ways of supporting containers. And again, it's similar to the scenario of, of different container engines, engines. I have a workflow, it works on my machine. I would like to make that, uh, make it run somewhere else. So, and, I, and as I mentioned, there are different, every resource manager out there has support for containers, but each of them does it in a very different way. So with Popper, again, we have this abstraction layer between the resource manager and the, and, the, and, the, and the user. And again, you see Popper run, that means run on my machine. If you add the flag, okay, use uh, Slurm as a resource manager, then you would be using, making use of the Slurm capabilities underneath. Um, which in this case might mean, for example, you're running uh, in parallel uh, a particular computation or, uh, or you're training a machine learning model and instead of running on your same machine, you would run on a different multiple nodes. Again, CI services is the same. You have very different, very 
different ways of accomplishing the same thing, which is continuously testing my code base, running unit tests, integration tests, and Popper allows you to do this. So you say, okay, I want this, I have this workflow, I wanna export it to and now so that it runs on Travis or runs on Jenkins or whatever. Um, so in, in a nutshell, Popper is, is, is implementing this idea of, of having one workflow and using that workflow, the way of expressing workflows to rule them all, to have, to use this as an abstraction for different environments, engines, resource managers, CI services, and whatnot. The, um, the project is, is very active. We get a lot, it's, it's based, this engine is based on Python. So Python is very familiar to new students. Uh, we put a lot of effort in creating like very descriptive issues, very descriptive project that, that students can uh, very quickly um, get uh, read and get, uh, get, get, get onboarded and we have a, a healthy community. We have a Slack, a Slack workspace. Uh, we also have a, 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 a space on Gitter. And the feedback I got is that undergrads and people starting to get into open source really enjoy working on this because it's one, it's approachable, two, is this is, is well described, and three, we have a community of people that are willing to help with uh, whatever you're working with. Um, some of the ideas we have for the summer are, uh, well, they're within the context of what I described. So for example, adding support for new container engines, adding support for uh, uh, resource managers. We're, we're in the process of adding Kubernetes and in the process of adding Podman, but there are many other engines, engines and resource managers, CI services, workflow engines that we could uh, we could use a lot of help with and use that as a very nice summer experience for students to, to, to contribute. Then that's on the side of the tool itself. Then on applying the, this, this approach to create reproducible workflows in many domains, that's another big category of projects that we work with. We have students, for example, that are running, that, are ha that have written workflows for running uh, experiments on Ceph, for running experiments on Ceph for different like public uh, network, I mean, cloud infrastructures like on Google or bare metal infrastructure. Um, we also collaborate closely with Skyhope, the Skyhope DM project that Jeff just presented earlier, uh, where we are, we are implementing these scalability tests that run on Kubernetes and on bare metal machines and automate everything and make it reproducible. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, opportunities for, for working with all these high performance uh, uh, system frameworks that are out there. Particularly, we're very interested in, in, in creating workflows for, for SPDK, for DPDK, CSTAR. And these, work, these, were, uh, these projects where it's actually really hard to get onboarded as a new student. And I, and, and, and I think we, we, Popper would help a lot with easing that learning, initial learning curve of installing all the dependencies and building the software and, and, and setting up tests. And also we have uh, other areas that we are working on like machine learning, computational research. Um, I have uh, a lot of experience mentoring. I, I think it's one of the things that I enjoy the most of being in academia and just uh, working one-on-one one -on -one with uh, new students. It's something that I really, really enjoyed. And throughout the years I've done it, in different contexts like Google Summer Code, uh, the Mozilla Open Leadership Programs and, 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 and other institutions that I've been affiliated with. Um, I think for Popper, I've mentored close to 12, 12, between 12 and 14 students and it's been a very, very nice experience. Um, I think that's it, that's all I have. Um, uh, feel free to ask anything yeah. and, or shoot me an email. So Ibo, thank you so much. The one workflow to rule them all, love it. Um, so uh, thank you so much. So I will also direct uh, questions to our online question answering. We're running uh, over time and I want to respect people's time. We only allocated really until uh, three o'clock, but it's already 10 minutes after three. But we also have this webinar until 3.30. And so if you have some extra time, stick around. We have one more uh, speaker. Um, 
and Kate Compton uh, is uh, is uh, uh, our newest addition to um, uh, our incubator fellowship. Um, and she's gonna uh, talk about uh, Tracery 2 and Chancery. Um, uh, so, that, you know, uh, and we, we weren't sure whether it's gonna be enough time, uh, but um, here she is, Kate, go ahead. All right. Stop sharing. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, there we go. So yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I didn't prepare any slides just because it was a bit of a late inclusion. Um, but so here's the main page of Tracery. So what Tracery is, is it's a context-free grammar library and pseudo language for people to specify generative text uh, in a way that is very forgiving and friendly for non-coders uh, and people who are on the artistic side of code. Uh, the goal is to have in the same way that you see more interesting, um, sorry, I'm losing, losing screens. Uh, in the same way that you see uh, people making more adventurous content in HTML than you see them making in some other languages, the idea is to make something that's forgiving and expressive. Um, and this is really taken off. Uh, let's see, um, there's some examples on tracery.io. Um, but if we look at uh, BotWiki, which is a site that tracks um, Twitter bots, um, and other kinds of creative art tools. Uh, you can see that there's 247 search results just on here of people who have made tutorials, people who have made bots, um, people who have made a variety of different pieces of software, and you can see there's 11 more pages of this. Um, so it's really taken off uh, and um, people continue to talk about it on Twitter. Uh, there's a very vibrant community. So the project that Cross is generously funding me for is to continue the development of Tracery uh, with Tracery2, uh, which has a bunch of additional features. I actually don't expect most of my 10,000 users to switch to Tracery 2, um, although Tracery 1 is embedded in Tracery 2, so they don't actually have to change anything. Uh, but this is more complex language for people who want to do, uh, say, more complex bots. Um, I'm also working on a language called Chancery, which is for conversational agents. Um, it was originally developed while I was working at Google, and they uh, very generously open sourced that. Um, so that's a, another language that grew out of Tracery. Um, but is for making sort of uh, Google Assistant style conversational agents. Um, and I thought that I had just started my first ever user for that, which is a group of uh, Swedish ambient musicians who are making a chat bot to go along with their album release. Um, but it turns out people have actually been using this just in spaces that I wasn't aware of. So there are in fact a couple of users of Chancery. Um, this is uh, currently a working prototype of uh, an authoring environment for people to um, author more complex things. So you can author in uh, JSON over here in uh, sort of plain text JSON, um, but you can also see that automatically. Um, so that's the plain text JSON. Uh, this is a visual editor where you can just like uh, use drop downs to author things. Um, you can browse, uh, so it's a context free grammar. Um, so you can browse by different symbols. Um, so if I want to see all the different like coffee types that I have available for this little story. So Here's the generator, so you can see uh, the um, recursively generated story here. Uh, I can turn that off and I can say, you know, make me, in fact, 25 of these little stories. Uh, so the idea here is to make something that users can make quite complex grammars, um, but also very easily navigate them. So you can see that this, like, this JSON object, because this is a fairly complex grammar, um, gets quite long. Uh, and so it's very difficult for novice users to be able to navigate this and uh, remember where in fact they specified um, what different kinds of cream you can have in your coffee. Uh, but this allows them to dynamically uh, edit that um, or to, as you're typing, uh, it automatically updates the JSON, it updates the story that you're writing. Um, so the idea is to have it highly reactive uh, so that people can work easily on it. So that's what I've been working on, um, that and getting Chancery off the ground. Um, so, uh, it's, un it's unclear, um, what people want, um, I'll stop, uh, the screen share. Um, it's unclear what folks want, um, as far as, uh, different features. Um, so I'm still sort of entertaining different options that students might want to pitch. Uh, some examples of those are, uh, um, 
one of the interesting things about a context-free grammar is that it is in fact context-free. Uh, and so any part of the grammar can expand without thinking about any other part of the grammar. However, that gets you into problems where you actually want to have connections in various generated content. Um, and so uh, there's interest in having a, uh, a SAT solver, which you heard about earlier. So having a SAT solver um, that is designed to uh, take a tracery grammar as its input and some constraints, and then come out with uh, traces of that, that grammar that satisfy those constraints. So you could say like, you know, give me a generated sandwich that has peanut butter and no non-vegetarian options. Um, and it will be able to generate uh, from whatever grammar you've given it, uh, things that satisfy your constraints. Um, so that's been a, a fairly frequent request over the years. Um, another one is a C-sharp port. Um, so C-sharp is the language that's used in Unity. Uh, if you're in the game space at all or in the entertainment space, Unity is, I think, probably the most common tool that games are being made in currently, um, or at least the most common of the sort of accessible tools. Um, and there have been a number of trace reports to C-sharp, but they're all fairly incomplete and none of them are gonna start approaching tracery two or chancery. Um, and so it'd be really interesting to have a student who's just dedicated to making a complete and reliable port in what's probably the second biggest space for this after JavaScript. Um, and then the third one is uh, like, we know that uh, open source projects are often not only about code, they're about community management and soft skills and organizing large groups of people. So more of a, an applied sociology project than a code project. Um, and so depending if there's student interest, uh, something where a, we get a student to basically serve as my deputy to do a lot of this community management, to organize a bunch of the people who are running tracery talks, uh, running tracery tutorials, making different tools for each other and help build out something that unifies this community a little bit better than I've done myself. Uh, so yeah, that is the, the lightning version. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I don't know if I went too fast to actually explain what the heck it is that Tracery does. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, so uh, any questions at the end? Um, we are unfortunately losing attendees because of the time. Um, mm -hmm. But thank you so much, Kate. Um, so I think if there are no other questions, um, please remember to fill out the, so for the attendees who are from organizations who might be able to support summer projects, uh, please remember to fill out those uh, that, that survey. Um, that are sent around and um, it really helps us to fine tune our, our effort. And um, other than that, I really thank, I uh, would like to thank our fellows and collaborators and mentors uh, to putting together a great portfolio of, of project ideas and there are more to come. Um, and I hope that uh, we hear back from you, from all of you, uh, the attendees um, and get this pro uh, project going and um, you know uh, uh, it would be fantastic if this works if we can actually uh, get a sustainable summer project um, uh, effort going with this kind of um, uh, structure so thank you so much and uh, I think um, we're done. Thank you. All right, thanks.